Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. Brian and I are super excited to be here and really looking forward to spending the next hour or so with you to discuss the topic of artificial intelligence and potential impact on medical education. Before we get started, we really want to thank uh, Dr. Rina Kurani for inviting us to talk about this topic. Um, uh, Dr. Rina Kurani is one of our favorite um, doctoral students in our program. And um, we're really excited to be talking about this uh, topic. And, uh, it's a really sexy topic right now. So uh, we're glad that we get to talk about this with you today. Um, there's a lot of excitement and buzz around artificial intelligence, um, especially with the release of the chat GPT last summer or last winter. Um, but we're excited to be engaging in a conversation around how this particular technology might impact education. And we also want to emphasize that we're just embarking on this journey of discovery together and hope that we could all learn from each other um, in events like this. And I think it's also important for us to think about as this technology is evolving so quickly, we think it is really important for us to really think about how we engage and participate in the discussion for potential impact. Otherwise, we may end up with innovations that may not really be helpful or useful to our community. And lastly, we know that you're really, really busy and thank you all for coming out to our presentation today and hopefully you'll learn something new. And most of all, we really hope that you'll have some fun with us today. And also Brian and I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So before we get started, we wanted to share a little background on the literature that's grounding our discussion today. The presentation today has been informed by several of the papers that Brian and I have co-authored recently. One paper is an Amy guide on artificial intelligence and medical education research that came out in Medical Teacher in June. Um, this is a paper that we explore some different types of AI and how it could have some potential uses across the medical education. And just this month, we uh, co-author a paper on ChatGPT and implications for ChatGPT on medical education. And that just came out in academic medicine. And lastly, uh, Brian has been doing some really amazing work in natural language processing and artificial intelligence to understand the relationship between narrative comments and entrustment decisions. And he'll share some of his insights and lessons learned from that research in a little bit later in this presentation. So before we get going on our conversation, uh, we thought we might start off with a question for you. Uh, what are you hoping to get out of the, today's talk? And if you can, um, if you could put your thoughts into the Google Doc, um, we'll put a link in the chat. And if you could open up the Google Doc and put some of your Thoughts, that would be wonderful. What do you think, Brian? Should we go ahead and share the Google Doc? Sure. Okay. I'm going to have Brian share the Google Doc. Great, right, maybe we'll give a minute Couple or more so. minutes, yeah. There's a good one in the chat. Copied over from the chat.
Oh, these are really good. <laughs> well, should we find out what Chappie T thinks the main topics are for today? So here's basically what ChatGPT thinks are the summary of the comments you typed in. It's a bit long for a summary. <laughs> so we might have to ask it, please combine the themes into only five. Let's see what it says. Integration and application in education academic and professional integrity, optimizing clinical research outcomes, addressing AI limitations and challenges, and efficiency and practicality. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I love the enthusiasm of ChatGPT. Thanks, thanks so much for all your comments. Yeah, the, the super helpful. Um, I'm going to go back to my slides. Um, okay, so we explore with the chat GPT that were the main themes of our discussion today. Um, but we hope we could cover some of the themes that you actually have outlined for us. Um, but here's our proposed agenda, and I think we'll get to some of the topics, hopefully. So first, we want to provide you with a brief introduction to AI and then a potential impact on learning, assessment, and medical education research. And lastly, we want to leave you with some resources specifically for clinician educators, and we hope that you'll be able to use that and also find potential collaborators through that process. So. Brief introduction to AI. So I want you to think about all the various ways that AI is impacting our lives currently, right now. How many of you use social media? Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I know some of you guys are out there doing TikToks. Um, do you use Google? Did you use your Google map to drive into the works this morning? Maybe. And how many of you had a conversation with the chatbot, chatbots instead of the real human beings lately. My guess is that everyone had had definitely interacted with AI today, this week, probably last week. So whether you like it or not, we are constantly engaging with AI in our day-to-day -day lives. Whether we like it or not, it's here to stay. And we really think that it's going to become even more pervasive in the next couple of years. But what about in healthcare? And don't worry, I saw this uh, in the chat, but don't worry, it's not going to replace you as a doctor. We could promise you that. But we all recognize that AI will have a significant impact on how we deal with, with healthcare. We know that it's going to have an impact on population healthcare management improve our clinical decision tools, and we'll probably see more and more integration of AI tools into our clinical delivery systems by improving automation and maybe using robotics more. So think, of, uh, for, think about for a moment how much time you would save and also have an impact on your well-being if you don't have to deal with your inbox issues. Think about that. So. We're hoping that we could optimize AI to make your lives easier, not only as a clinician educator, a clinicians, but also as educators. So why the recent buzz? Why this excitement? So there's been a lots of lots of press lately, in the, especially in the popular press. And here's some of the few example headlines from the news in the last couple months. 
when the chat GPT first came out, everyone was concerned about the potential use of chat GPT by students to plagiarize. That was the main concern. But then we quickly learned that banning the tool wasn't really going to solve the problem. And everyone now recognizes that this is going to be a software, a tool that's going to be here. And whether we love it or hate it, and I love this headline from Chronicles of Higher Ed, love it or hate it, academics can't ignore the already pervasive technology. And what do you think about this one from AMA? The headline says, ChatGPT passed the USMLE. What does that mean for Met Ed? That's a good question for us, right? So how about we test it out for ourselves? How many of you have actually used ChatGPT? Raise your hand if you have used ChatGPT recently. Yeah, some, and hopefully by end of this talk, I hope that you'll go and try it out for yourself. Um, so look at the look at the uh, question. This is an example question that I pulled, and I want you to take a look and see if you could identify the correct answer. So this is like a board example board question. And then I asked the chat GPT to give me a correct answer. What do you think? So not only did chat GPT get the correct answer, but it gave me a pretty good justification. I think really, I mean, you know, reasonable justification. So at this point, I'm totally intrigued. So how does ChatGPT actually work? What is it doing? I'm not gonna go into all the technical details of how ChatGPT works, but I wanna give you a sense of how generative AI or the tools like ChatGPT, what it's actually doing and under the hood. So there are several steps the ChatGPT takes from getting your prompt to giving you a output or response. So there are several steps to this, but the most important one is that it actually, the ChatGPT and other generative AI tools use massive, massive billions of amounts of data that's already out there. And that's from the internet, from books, everything that's published ever. And so it's able to train based on the data that's already available. And these data, these data elements are coded, they're encoded, they're organized, they're tagged, and they're organized into a pattern so that when we interact with it, it's able to use an algorithm to figure out what is the appropriate next set of outputs. So the model actually uses machine learning, neural networks, natural language processing, all these different branches of artificial intelligence to maximize how it really works with natural language, right? So it is a model of probabilities. So what it does is it takes your prompt and matches it to the data it already has and it creates and embeds it within the algorithm to come up with the what's the best predicted next set of words or sentences sentences that goes with that particular prompt. And so one of the key things that it's really super exciting about general AI is that through this loop of pre-training with the data that's already out there and encoding using machine learning, deep learning, and it uses the neural networks to figure out different patterns and large language models to figure out what are the right kinds of next set of sentences really is, larger language models are trained on set of um, 
all the different data sets that's out there. And then it comes with the predictive model. Like we're, they're using like regression analysis essentially to come up with the what best guess, right? Best predicted outcome. And so when it interacts with the human beings, it actually gets a feedback. And that information, it gets feedback into this loop and it actually improves the algorithm. And so that's one of the most powerful thing about the generative AI. Unlike the previous tools where the, the AI is designed to do one specific task with one specific algorithm, it now it learns or it actually gets better with interaction from the human beings and the feedback from the human beings. And that's why it's so powerful. And that's why we're so excited about this new tool. So <clears throat> another, another really cool thing about this current ChatGPT generative AI tools is that it's actually maximizing all the different branches and research that are happening within the artificial intelligence. So machine learning, natural language processing, expert systems, neural networks, this is what I was talking to you about. But now it's able to intersect with speech recognition and vision, and that's coming down the pipe. And then think about how, when that's integrated with robotics, that's going to be super, super powerful. So that's where we're headed in the next few years. So here's some of the list of most popular AI tools out there currently. And most of these are free access. And you could go in and get online and try these out today. There's a text version like the ChatGPT, Bing, Bar. Uh, there's a literature synthesis tool. I don't know if you guys try that, maybe try that out. Speech recognition tool, that's getting better. And images, and Brian will share with you later. He did most of his image pre uh, presentation today using the Dolly. So really, really powerful tools out there that are free. So now we wanna really explore some of the potential impact of these tools on learning, assessment, and research because we're clinician educators and this is what we really care about. So we're gonna talk about potential impact on learning specifically, and we're gonna use some use cases for that. Assessment, and I'm going to talk about a couple of very uh, immediate impact use cases for those. And then also Brian will talk about some of the impact on medical education research. So with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Brian. All right, well, let's brainstorm a little bit about how uh, we might use AI in learning. And since it's such a vast topic, maybe I'll just focus uh, on how students might use AI and what teachers might teach students about it. And then on the next slide, you'll see um, this excuse that we're used to, of, uh, my dog ate my homework, but in the, a realm of, of chatbots, including ChatGPT, Bard, uh, Llama, and so forth. Will we ever see this excuse again? It becomes a legitimate question. Not only uh, that, but but a, a, a potential cause of concern for teachers. Um, on the next slide, um, let's think about the potential uses of chatbots uh, by students. Uh, so these range from the more, um, I guess, concerning uses and potentially less um, uh, or more problematic uses, such as a replacement for thinking uh, to provide direct answers, um, similar to how students might currently just use an answer key or, or pay somebody to, to do their homework. Um, and then more productive uses, uh, such as the human-machine collaborations, where students may uh, first think about their own a response and uh, work on it, and then put it into a chatbot or other generative AI and see if it could potentially enhance their answer uh, via uh, more references or, or information. And then lastly, we can think about potentially using AI as a tutor um, that maybe if a single teacher is not available for all, say, 50 students in a large class, can a student then interact with an AI to receive feedback that's customized to the particular needs. Um, so sort of these opportunities and uh, run the gamut. Um, and 
I think one thing useful is to think about the potential pitfalls that you can have uh, by using AI. So let's take a uh, look at one of these potential uh, pitfalls uh, of using AI uh, for uh, 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 students uh, in learning. So on the next slide, um, we'll try to use a chatbot to answer a PBL style question. So this one happens to be asking about why a term baby may be stiffening to a loud noise. And on the next uh, slide, you could see the response from ChatGPT um, showing that uh, it's probably due to the moral reflex uh, and that this is normal at a two week old uh, time frame, but also uh, skipping the controversy of uh, uh, whether this is a moral reflex or a startle reflex uh, and whether those two are different or not. Um, on the next slide, so I asked then ChatGPT in this case to provide references for this information. And you can see here the, what it gave. It says that I don't have direct access to provide real-time or most up-to-date references. And then it suggests that I look at textbooks and, and guidelines. So I think this is a real limitation of uh, ChatGPT and other uh, chatbots in that they're not able to provide the direct references for the information they assert as correct. Um, and so in medicine, uh, being so tied to uh, evidence and tied not only to, to secondary evidence, but also the primary evidence from the individual studies and the contexts in which they were performed. And this is all not uh, transparent in the responses that at least ChatGPT gives. Um, and so it severely limits its ability to be used um, for learning uh, from primary sources in this case. So maybe it's a good summarizer of information but uh, summaries without uh, sort of references are, are quite problematic, especially uh, when we uh, have high standards for, for being able to trace uh, information to their sources in medicine. So on the next slide, um, one uh, of many groups who have thought about um, uh, what uh, standards should be taught to students, particularly medical students about AI, is a group uh, led by Russell et al. And I particularly like this, um, uh, set of competencies they came up with for what uh, we as medical educators can help uh, students to learn. Uh, one of those um, uh, competencies is that of uh, evidence-based evaluation of AI tools. And on the next slide, um, uh, it relates to the critical appraisal of chatbots. So basically since chatbots are sort of predicting the new uh, responses based on previous training data, they basically carry forward biases that may be represented in that data. And then without knowing exactly what data is being sort of amalgamated into its responses, we can't be certain what biases those are. And so a lot of effort recently has been made into detecting those biases, but um, it might be also useful to sort of retrain the chatbots from the ground up with those biases in mind uh, and going forward. So I think transparency um, uh, with the data that's being used for training will be really important uh, for future iterations of, of chatbots or other generative AI. Uh, and in particularly uh, the scope of the data uh, that's uh, being used uh, for generating responses is not uh, transparent either. And for medicine, that's that's key, right? For, for, for knowing the background of the study and the populations they've used to generate those results. And so without that information, the, 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 the information generated may be useless. Um, and then uh, furthermore, uh, sometimes there could be misinformation in the data that's fed into the um, uh, chatbot during training and being able to detect that at all stages of uh, generation would be important. And then lastly, there's the issue of hallucinations in chatbots. And uh, you've probably heard that term before, uh, but that has to do with chatbots sort of making information up and asserting it as being uh, correct. And the reason why um, this happens so frequently is because the chatbots are essentially probabilistic. So they choose the best answer among many that they're considering. And what's not transparent in the chatbots is basically what are those probabilities that they are considering? So future iterations of chatbots or other generative AI for the purposes of medicine need to be transparent about probabilities and how certain they are about their answers before asserting uh, one as, as being correct. So these are all things that it can be useful for teachers to teach uh, students in order to sort of understand uh, AI and appraise it just like any other source of information, any other 
expert um, uh, that they've encountered, uh, AI being one of them with these potential uh, uh, increased uh, risks of, of misinformation and bias. All right, I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Christy to talk about assessment. Yeah, so, um, so now I will briefly touch upon uh, potential impact of AI or ChatGPT specifically on assessment. And for assessment, I'm going to really focus on item generation and scoring specifically. And so, uh, so let's say you're a faculty asked to develop some assessment items for a pre-clerkship exam that you just recently lectured on. How would you use ChatGPT to help you get started? Um, let me share an example of a ChatGPT prompt that I used. Um, so I asked the ChatGPT write a question, test question similar to USM, USMLE Step 1, using the following learning objective. Describe the T-cell regulation and how this regulation of different TH subsets causes different disease states. And here's what the ChatGPT gave me. So if first gave me a pretty good clinical scenario and the response options, and also provided with me the correct answer. And then it gave me this really nice long explanation and justification. So not bad as a starting point, right? But what I'm most excited about is I asked the ChatGPT to help me figure out what are some of the potential misconceptions the students may have on this topic? And here's what the ChatGPT provided. It gave me this super detailed, really helpful information about potential places where the students might have misconceptions on this topic. This is super helpful. When I'm developing assessment items, this is what I'm actually thinking about. And so, I thought this was a really, really helpful starting point for item generation. So here's an example of another way that I think potentially ChatGPT type of tools could help you, specifically on scoring. So here's an example where I had the ChatGPT score an assessment item. Um, and this was actually an assignment that I gave to students around sharing their reflections based on some of the comments that they re received during their collection. So I used the scoring rubric where the scoring rubric, this is an established scoring rubric. It's on a five point scale from zero to five. And it really looks at the level of reflection. And so the, I asked the ChatGPT to read this narrative the students ha student has written and then score based on the scoring rubric that I just gave. And this is what it gave me back. So the statement was graded as five and it provided this really nice justification. And I would have done the same thing. I would have probably given it a five and probably came up with a similar set of justifications. So, this is kind of exciting. This is really, really helpful. So I wanna pause here and ask you, do you think that you could figure out some ways that you might be able to use tools like ChatGPT for your assessment? What do you think? Anyone else there? Anyone else out there as excited as I am? I'm just in shock. I have to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm just in shock. <laughs> okay, the power of this tool. This is the first time I've actually seen it in use. So I, <laughs> yeah, pretty interesting, don't you think? Yeah, there's. Lots I mean, there's. A, I'll make one comment that's actually serious. Uh -huh. The last example you gave, and I'm sorry, my name is Joel Foreman. I'm the vice chair of education in Pete's, and thank you so much for this for giving this talk and letting us um, ask questions. Um, in the last example you gave, I could imagine a tool like this helping to avoid my bias interfere with um, uh, with grading, right? Because this will do it the same way each time to each response. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't know who the person, it doesn't carry any of the potential racial biases or anything else or mm -hmm. gender biases that I might bring without realizing it. 
So that could be very attractive. Yeah, you know what? Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Brian has some examples of how we need to really think about using these tools for scoring, especially narrative comments. And there's some there's some caveats. So we want to really share that with you before you go off and start using this. <laughs> but um, but yeah, very good point. I totally agree with you. I think the potential for this is endless, especially if we were thinking about for DEI issues, uh, bias, but there's some bias inherent in the tool. So we really need to be cautious and we'll talk about that. So before you start going out and using ChatGPT, I want to share three important points. Um, these are some of the caveats. Because the U.S. does not have a universal privacy law, each, is, each educational institution must ensure compliance with the FERPA and privacy laws of their own state. And so now many of the schools have created specific policies around use of Generate AI. Uh, UCSF, for example, there's a firewall. We can't really upload any student-generated information up into ChatGPT. Um, so we're developing our own in, um, in collaboration with the Microsoft. And so we're going to have our own version of ChatGPT. Um, and also, as Brian alluded to this, it does make up stuff. It's not always correct. So you have to check for accuracy of the content information. And lastly, I really think that it's important for us to model good ethical behavior and really providing appropriate attribution to AI and ChatGPT specifically, and really ask the learners to do the same. So it's a really good modeling for us to be using ChatGPT and giving the right attributions. So those are three of my main concerns or considerations for you to think about before you start going out there using this. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Brian, who's going to talk about AI and research. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so I see your questions about uh, bias, I think, are, are definitely uh, super relevant. And so we'll try to address that a little bit in study number two when we talk about it, but uh, also try to take some time at the end uh, to, to address bias as well, since it's such an important uh, topic. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about a couple of the studies we did uh, using um, uh, AI to analyze uh, narrative feedback. And uh, the first study, we basically used uh, AI to identify narrative features that were tied to entrustment ratings uh, in these sort of uh, uh, workplace-based assessments. And in study two, we then used AI to compare supervisors and trainee viewpoints of entrustment basically how they documented uh, feedback differently and also looked for potential sources of bias there. And so uh, we'll uh, go through study number one uh, relatively quickly then, uh, since it has less to do with bias. And maybe I'll skip this slide then. Uh, so basically, if for study number one, we actually didn't use ChatGPT and we didn't use ChatGPT for either of these studies. This was before for the time of that. So uh, we developed the, the algorithms from the ground up. Uh, and here we basically trained an algorithm to uh, take narrative feedback, such as the one shown on the left, and then predict an entrustment rating from it. And so how does that happen? Uh, so on the next slide, we basically uh, show that in order to do this, you have to have many, many pairs of such data, uh, where it's essentially uh, there's a label of uh, the um, entrustment level uh, tied to a particular uh, narrative. And basically what the AI algorithm does or the deep learning algorithm does is recognize patterns that exist in this uh, training data. And showing on the next slide, uh, it's sort of like a monkey see, monkey do sort of situation where the algorithm will learn the patterns and then try to repeat them when given only the narrative, then can it then uh, predict the entrustment level from it. Uh, so showing on the next slide uh, is uh, how well this particular training did. So you can see that uh, the AI algorithm was able to uh, generate an area under the curve of about uh, 60 to 70 percent for some of the entrustment levels. So it, it sort of surprised me because I didn't think that there was actually going to be much of a tie uh, between the entrustment uh, narratives and, and, and the rating. Um, and so in order to figure out what was happening here, we had to then take the algorithm apart. So shown on the next slide uh, is how we did that. Um, so how does it 
tie uh, the narrative feedback to the entrustment rating. So in order to know that, we uh, show the different steps that an algorithm takes on the next slide. Uh, and so the narrative is first uh, tokenized into different numbers, essentially, that the algorithm uses to internally represent the words, and then uh, uses uh, word vectors then to represent those meanings uh, of those words. And it's not those vectors themselves that actually carry uh, the information we want. It's basically the space, the abstract sort of dimensional space in which they're uh, represented by the algorithm that carries the meaning. And basically each one of the dimensions in this space uh, represents some abstract meaning, which we have to then identify. So how do we do that? So on the next slide, uh, so one of the ways to uh, analyze dimensions is to use principal component analysis or factor analysis. So we could do that here. And then secondly, um, we can also look at the neurons themselves in the deep learning network. So these artificial neurons then are at different stages of activation as they sort of read over the narrative feedback. And then we can go in and look at those activations and figure out which words are activating them. So combining these uh, techniques then on the next slide, uh, we were able then to uh, identify themes that uh, the AI was recognizing and using to make its uh, predictions. So in this particular case, it identified uh, constructive feedback on technical skills uh, as, a, as a theme that was used uh, to make its prediction. So in summary, for this particular study, on the next slide, um, we found that it used the three feedback characteristics to make entrustment rating predictions. Uh, those were the feedback type, whether it was constructive versus reinforcing the level of detail, and whether it was pro procedural or, or cognitive. Uh, so what we found was that the levels of detail were greater at the extremes of the entrustment scale, suggesting that uh, when uh, those were chosen, that they needed to be justified more carefully. Um, all right. So on the next slide, uh, we have the uh, second study. And so this one may be more relevant to the question of bias. And so in this case, we had almost uh, 24 or more than 24,000 pairs of, of entrustment ratings and feedback narratives. So if we were to have uh, uh, coded that by hand, it would have taken 30 straight days without uh, taking breaks. Um, uh, if you only took one minute each to code each one of those, those uh, uh, narratives. Uh, and if you didn't sleep, I guess you could get it done in 15 days. But, but if you slept, it would take 30 days. Uh, without lunch breaks either. But anyway, so the goals of the coding we wanted to do here was to identify the themes in those narratives and then to assess the sentiment of them, which is the emotional tone or the valence, sort of whether it's like a positive tone or a negative tone. And then lastly, uh, we wanted to compare the codes between uh, how uh, supervisors and trainees uh, were documenting feedback and then to stratify uh, them by potential sources of bias to identify whether those uh, potential sources would affect uh, the entrustment or the tone uh, that was uh, in the narratives. So on the next slide, uh, we used large language models, and this was before the day of ChatGPT. So we actually used one called uh, BERT, which was the first uh, large language model, at least the first sort of uh, publicly available one. And we modified it in, in each case to, to generate the, the coding that we wanted it to do. Um, so on the next slide, uh, so here's the results from the thematic content uh, representation. And so on the left are the supervisors' uh, themes, and on the right were the trainees. So basically what happened was that there was a feedback dialogue, and either the supervisors or the trainees uh, were to document uh, that feedback dialogue. And then we looked at which themes uh, sort of arose from each set. So from the supervisor set on the next slide, you can see that most of these themes tended to focus on the oral presentations. Whereas for the trainees, the themes appear to be more holistic. Um, so maybe this reflects the fact that for supervisors, their primary interaction with the trainees was actually through oral presentations. Uh, whereas for trainees, their viewpoint uh, sort of, of uh, getting used to or fitting into the clinical learning environment, they had to consider many more things than just their oral presentations. All right, so on the next slide, uh, here are some potential benefits and, and uh, disadvantages of using AI um, in this context. So we might not need to train uh, the LLM or the large language model on specific data. So for instance, like ChatGPT, we basically threw it uh, some medical content and it, and it did okay with it. Uh, however, 
um, the potential disadvantage there is that the, the results might not be appropriate for our particular research context or scope. So there's efforts then made to sort of being able to tailor different large language models like the ones behind ChatGPT for specific contexts. Another advantage includes uh, the ability to understand language and meaning. However, uh, that understanding carries the biases that was present uh, in the training data and also biases that the algorithm may have developed on its own. Uh, thirdly, uh, the uh, LLM can process vast amounts of uh, text data quickly and consistently, but may not be transparent about how certain it is about that processing. So it may assign a code, but it may not tell you how certain it is that that code should be applied. Um, and then lastly, uh, potential advantages of, of using it to code are, are balanced by the fact that algorithmic reflexivity is not well defined. So where does the algorithm stand in relation to to, to its data and, and, to, and to different theories. So, so that's not uh, well-defined at the moment and efforts are being made to, to go there. All right, so let's take an example of, of AI bias in, in case in point. So what we'll be able to identify here is uh, a bias that exists in the algorithm itself and also a bias that exists in the data. So in order to actually be able to de detect a bias that lives in the data, one would have to then be able to assess bias in the algorithm itself. So here we took the example of a sentiment analysis, understanding the tone of, of a narrative, and we trained a large language model uh, to predict um, this uh, sentiment. And uh, the output that we trained it to give was that if it gave a 0%, it meant that the sentiment was most likely negative and 100% meant that it was a positive. And if so, 50% might mean that it's, it's uh, somewhere in the middle. So here's a particular um, quote that we had and it assigned this particular quote, a sentiment of 18.2. So mostly negative uh, because it has this um, uh, sort of constructive nature where if you uh, maybe started out with a feedback sandwich or something positive, but, but later it said, I was not impressed. So um, uh, if we go on to the next slide, so what I wanted to do was understand the bias that the algorithm I have for, for, for gender. So I used a gender, I added a gendered pronoun to the sentence. So if I put he or she there, you'll notice that the algorithm uh, tended to give a he pronoun a positive bias for sentiment with no other change. And um, in the next slide, you can see that if I use a, um, uh, a, 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 um, uh, a non-specific pronoun or, or a non-binary pronoun of they, it, 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 gen it uh, generated even lower sentiment. So, so this was very concerning to me. Uh, and, and so basically it invalidated any result I would get from, from using this algorithm. Um, and so how did we then mitigate this? So what we had to do was we uh, removed all the gendered pronouns from the training data set and we replaced them then with they, uh, them, and the, the non-binary uh, uh, pronouns. And then uh, we then retrained the, the cl classifier, we retrained the entire uh, chatbot essentially uh, with this data. And then we also removed the gender pronouns from our own uh, data set. So in that case, there was no difference then between what pronoun you used. Uh, and so only then could we see a difference in, in the actual data. So here we show uh, how the sentiment differed between the supervisors and trainees. And what we see here is that basically supervisors tended to sort of avoid uh, negative sentiment as much as possible, even for lower end of the, the entrustment rating scale. If we wanted to understand um, further uh, potential biases in the data on, on the next slide as well. And so uh, we can see the, the former result here of uh, when the trainee uh, was a writer, they actually didn't avoid um, negative language as much. So they had more negative language writing about themselves than their supervisor did. So uh, where did this come from? On the next slide, uh, we can see that um, for uh, uh, on average, uh, female trainees tended to use more negative language about themselves than male trainees and that this um, uh, was uh, significant. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we could see uh, whether this was present in the supervisor data or the trainee data. And we see that it's um, mostly present in the trainee data, not in the supervisor data. So there's, the supervisor tended to be less uh, biased than the trainees somehow. Um, okay, on the next slide. Uh, so we did something similar for uh, using uh, underrepresented in medicine status of the students as well to see if there was a, a bias. And we did see one, although it was in the, the opposite direction. Um, 
So one of the important points we found as well is that there was actually no gender or UIM related bias in the entrustment ratings. And this bias basically only existed in the language used then to express entrustment. So, so what do we think about this? So on the next slide, uh, we think that uh, bias then appears to affect the trainee's self-receptions more than the actual degree of entrustment they experience. But these biases are still important because they reflect basically the trainee's response to things in the environment, uh, in the culture. And so um, basically it's important for uh, then uh, 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 teachers, then uh, uh, clinical teachers to, um, uh, to um, sort of acknowledge these potential sources of bias that may be affecting uh, a trainee's um, assimilation into their clinical roles and their ability to form uh, trusting relationships. Uh, so, all right, thank you. So as promised, um, we wanna leave you with some resources specifically for educators. So here's some resources that I particularly like. Um, the one by Margaret Mahill, Merrill, um, she's out of uh, University of California, Davis, and she curated this absolutely wonderful Google Doc where she put all kinds of resources across multiple institutions in one document. So I highly recommend you check that out. It's really cool. She's also updating it on a regular basis. So lots of new things up there. Um, there's some stuff out of the um, Department of Education. Um, it's just a quick overview. So nothing too uh, technical in there. There's some really good guides out of the UC Berkeley. Um, there's also stuff out of UC Irvine that I really like. And then the ISTE, which is an organization for educators working with the technology, which I think um, they're right now it's not as extensive, but they're building the their um, their toolkit. So definitely check that out as well. So those are some of the recommendations for our um, resources. And we also want to acknowledge um, our AI tool. Uh, Brian did most of his drawing uh, creation using Dolly. And we also want to thank you all for um, having us. And thank you, Dr. Karani, for inviting us to have fun with this group. And you are um, so welcome to reach out to us anytime. We're happy to talk about this topic. And we're excited uh, that we're in the new era of artificial intelligence. So with Thank that, you. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Thank you, Dr. Boscardin and Jen. And if we can, we have a few minutes for questions. If you don't mind either raising your hand um, using um, the Zoom reactions button 